the recording now. <laughs> All right. Whenever you're ready. Awesome. Um, so as she said, I'm my name is Cassandra Freeman. I graduated in 2012 and I've been on a long journey since then, and I am now a hemp farmer and vegetable farmer in Southwest Colorado. So I live in the Four Corners area near Cortez and Dolores um, in a little town called Mancus. So just share a screen. Uh, it's this one, right? Is that how that works? Perfect. Yeah. Everyone can see? Okay, awesome. Uh, so this is um, the view from uh, our farm. So this is what we see as Mesa Verde. And I just have a few short uh, pictures on here. But we started our farm in 2019 and we just wanted to grow industrial hemp. We had worked on a few co-op farms and just started learning how to grow our own vegetables and things like that. And the layout of our farm this was our first season, so it was pretty large. Uh, we were able to plant nearly 12 acres <clears throat> by hand. So we had to crawl on our hands and knees just to plant each individual plant that we needed to put in the field. Um, it's much smaller now. We're about a quarter of the size, um, but we just had the luxury of having this great open space that used to be a hay field that a lot of livestock, especially yaks, our neighbor's a yak rancher. So they used to graze <clears throat> on this property. Uh, before we bought it. We have a pond, we've got irrigation and our greenhouses uh, down here. So it's just been a really long journey to figuring out <clears throat> exactly everything we need to do. Water is a huge issue for us. Um, mm. So we have great irrigation water when the water's on, but otherwise it gets shut off if we have a drought year, which the last Last summer was a drought year and we were very grateful that our neighbors allowed us to tap their ponds so we could keep growing through the whole season and actually finish this year in our second year. <clears throat> um, so we started with a mixture of planting seeds direct to uh, planting clones as well. So yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't know, is this hemp farming? Uh, but yeah, so anyways, as we've like gone through this, like I've been meditating on the idea of like, how am I using my degree in everything that we're doing now? You know, my husband is Turkish, so he's got a whole different side of the world of history that I don't have. And so we talk a lot about similarities and differences and understandings and how are we pairing those things together. For him, agriculture is just, it's in his family. It's what he's been uh, set out to do for me it's not been very much in my family at all uh, so being able to embark in this direction to grow our own food as we're starting to plant each year we start with a little bit more and a little bit more uh, that we can utilize and I'm learning how to can so we can store our food and we have a freeze dryer so now we can actually really harvest everything and store it for a very long time uh, so it's very important to us that we are doing everything we can work-wise that also sustains us outside of uh, money. So we use the hemp to grow our food because if you have rows uh, in here, why not you know, dedicate five rows to corn, potatoes, tomatoes, any sort of a vegetable in that direction. I started off pretty small. Um, this is my first little attempt at a garden. Uh, it's actually the last place I got to see Jess was in this garden at the end of the season because she came over to visit and we harvested the last of our eggplants and our cucumbers. And we were just like walking around in this little garden here, um, just uh, finishing it out. But this was my little tester of like, oh, we got a little patch of broccoli, we got a little patch of cucumber um, and just trying to work also with the native soils and not doing anything that is, uh, chemical <laughs> is the main goal. You know, you don't want chemicals in your food and you don't want to be <clears throat> ruining the, the ground and the soil like that by killing microbial life. So we also focus a lot on growing as organic as possible, which we're working on organic certification uh, for this year on our farm. So we can really like have that be set on paper because everybody wants paper for things. So we're working toward doing that. We make our own natural ferments. Uh, we include a lot of the natural grasses and weeds and things like that into the ferments to get the microorganisms of this area and not just trying to buy some big barrel of fermented 
uh, microbial teas, brew teas, uh, to then inject into the water system. So we create those ourselves. Um, Jess was awesome because whenever she came to visit, she'd run away and go grab fistfuls of weeds <laughs> and uh, bring them to us and tell us all the information she could uh, remember for them. Or then she'd bring out her big plant book and you know she would key them out and be like, oh, this plant is for this and this and this and this. And so as much as I wish I remembered all the details, I don't because I was so enthralled with her passion uh, for plants that uh, her and I were always a decent balance. And like, she had the knowledge and I had like, why not? Why don't we try this out? I'm gonna put it in the ground and put some water on it and uh, see how it goes. And she's like, I do not have a green thumb. So you go girl. <laughs> and I was like, well, I don't have any knowledge. So let's pair that together. Um, you know, after uh, her passing and stuff like that, I definitely have taken on a lot more of the responsibility to try to learn and remember uh, um, as much as I can, you know, without her being here, I feel like I have to fill a gap in a lot of uh, space that she filled much larger than me that I now need to try my best to uh, put back together in my life as well as share it with others. Um, so I set out and I planted the three sisters this summer. I had my squash, corn, and beans. I did not build mounds like I was supposed to because again, I just experiment and throw water on it. And uh, the corn did really well. We had a lot of sweet corn and the squash did really well, but the beans didn't take because I had nothing to grow up. Um, but yeah, so then we've also planted carrots out here and just, again, testing things out. This was an artichoke, never plant artichoke in the Southwest <laughs> in a place where uh, it also snows because it's never enough time for them to finish. They were big, beautiful like this all summer, but we got no artichokes. <laughs> so it was also, um, you have to, I'm learning what works in this area as well. And I hope to eventually create some sort of like a program <clears throat> on weekends or something because I'm right next to the Ute Mountain Reservation and Southern Ute and the Navajo Reservation. And there's a lot of kids out here that might not know how to grow food or just don't have that person that's willing to spend the time to talk their ear off about it. So as I'm learning, I'm also like taking notes and trying to remember. So that way in the future, I could possibly do like a little quick summer program of like six or so weeks where they, you know, come out with their parents, they gather, we learn how to grow things. They have something to show for it at the end of the summer. So it's like, yes, we, you know, grew something and, you know, this learning about the water and the weather plays, you know, huge roles in all of these. So it's my little baby eggplant. Um, <laughs> and then these are Turkish peppers. Um, since my husband's Turkish, he, his father brought seeds back from Turkey and we planted them. And these one in 10 are spicy, but they grow excellent out here. And so it's nice to see like all of the New Mexico chili peppers and the jalapenos and all of that. And now we've like, ah, I've brought Turkish peppers, which uh, I guess could be a little colonizing if I let them roam free. So we're keeping them contained. <laughs> um, but yeah, so then we have cucumbers, uh, potatoes. I tried potatoes this year that worked out pretty well. Um, we had uh, behind me in this photo is our hemp field. So like I said, and we have all these rows, we have drip lines, we have water. And so we're like, why don't we plant tomatoes in the middle? So we had about four to five different uh, types of tomatoes and they all grew really well. We had really big tomatoes. We had huge cherry tomato plants. Um, and most of the job when it comes to farming as we've really learned, especially with hemp, is the harvesting is the most important part is the ability to harvest it before a cold snap, always paying attention to the weather patterns. Um, and just, I don't know if anyone grows tomatoes at all, but if you have green tomatoes and colds coming, just harvest the green tomatoes, stick them in a box, they'll ripen and you'll have more tomatoes later. And so I like had always a surprise box of like, why do I have tomatoes still? But it's because I just saved all the green ones and, um, just learning how to ripen, how to ferment things. Um, our neighbor has a yak ranch, as I said, so they're, uh, they graze on our open fields, poop everywhere, and we get lots of, you know, wonderful manure. And this is Valentino. He's a really awesome yak. He did chase me on an ATV this summer that I crashed, but they're very like wonderful, gentle giants. And it's just been a really good experience uh, with everybody just learning about animals and how they take care of them and how 
you know, our neighbors, fortunately, are folks that if they were to sell any <clears throat> yaks to another farmer, they don't sell one yak. They sell two at a time because they want the animals to have a friend, to be in a pair, to have a companion. And they're very particular about who owns yaks because 7,000 feet is the lowest a yak can really <clears throat> uh, live at. And so it's just, we're getting all sorts of different information from different areas because eventually in the future, we want to branch out into having our own livestock, goats, and we already have a bunch of chickens. I have 20 chickens um, that are laying hens that will uh, also turn into meat birds in the future. So it's just a lot of uh, learning. <clears throat> we grew watermelons and pumpkins and just anything I could think to throw in the ground is what we did uh, this summer. And again, big part is the harvesting, but it's really fun and it makes me feel a lot better. So <clears throat> in the development of this, I've learned that the way that I'm using my degree is by being able to learn how to grow my own food and then to hopefully share with other people or encourage other folks to start trying to grow their own food themselves. Um, we live in a pretty reasonable countryside space where like, you know, town is 10, 15 minutes if we really need to go to the store for something. But our goal is to really take a huge step back from needing to depend on that. And I have yet to figure out the conundrum of uh, living in a city and being able to have access um, to farming and good quality <clears throat> organically grown food. Um, so I haven't figured that part out yet, but um, even if you just grow one tomato plant, like that just, it can, it keeps your hands in the soil. It keeps your yourself connected to something outside of yourself that nourishes you back. And it has no thoughts about it, you know, other than, you know, please give me some water. Like, <laughs> just do that. You take care of it, it takes care of you and you have a really good relationship. And it's, you know, I talk to the plants all the time you know, I'm also alone out here quite a bit, you know, they, they keep my secrets and then nourish me at the end. Um, so yeah, so we just really focus on learning how to uh, can is what I was trying to do with the, our neighbors who are yak ranchers. They do a lot of canning with their vegetables that they grow every year and they have a whole like uh, root cellar storage room. So mm -hmm. we're working on learning how to do all of that, learning how to ferment different types of foods to keep them longer. And just again, just really getting back to <clears throat> what I feel is very deeply important to native people and how, again, I really feel like I'm using my degree actively in the sense that like, as I'm working, I remember the history. I remember what was fought for and on the days where I'm like, this is really hard and I'm really sad that some plant died, but it's like, that's okay because I'm still here and I'm still able to try and I'm still able to bring more knowledge into myself that I can then give out to others and hopefully not obviously fill the gap of Jess um, being gone now but like try to attempt to honor her that way by continuing to try and push harder for knowledge that doesn't come so naturally to me as it did for her like she could read any scientific name in the book and remember it off the top of her head at any time and I'm still struggling to like pronounce words. Um, so that's been really nice. I don't know if anyone sees my little kitty down here <laughs> in the corner. He just like popped in there real quick. <laughs> He's just super cute. That's my little cypress. Um, but yeah, so canning has been a big deal, learning about bacterias and how they can benefit us. And I also read another book, uh, Get inspired by Jess because one of her favorite authors was uh, Barbara Kingsolver. She mm -hmm. has a book uh, that's, uh, what's it? Miracle Vetch, darn it, I forgot the title, but it's like her one year with her family in a food journey, uh, moving from Arizona to, I think it was uh, Virginia, mm -hmm. and just trying to grow and eat food within a certain radius if you can manage it. Obviously, it's really hard when you're a city, you can't manage keeping your food source very close um, within a certain mile radius to you. But it did talk about how beneficial those things are to our bodies and our gut biome as we're learning more about the reciprocity of the foods we eat, having such an effect on our mental state, our emotional state, um, the clarity of mind, things like that. So uh, that book is really inspired to keep me like, okay, I need to keep food close to home as much as I can, offer it and gift it out to neighbors and just try to, you know, really focus on a home community. Because again, 
had I been more inspired sooner, had more like knowledge sooner, I feel like at the very least, like growing like a tomato plant, like could have really benefited me in a city um, in those ways, like a, a cucumber plant, they have hanging uh, cucumber baskets too. So it's just uh, building on that with everybody. So back to hemp, um, our main <laughs> crop. So we're, we're still honing in our skill, but it's gotten better and better each year. Our first year, we had a very wide gradient because we didn't understand water systems. We didn't understand the weather patterns as well as we do now to know when to plant, when to harvest, um, how long to let the plant grow to say, uh, keep compliant. That's the hard part with hemp right now. Hemp could be such an amazing crop across the United States and it is, but a lot of farmers are getting, uh, <clears throat> really stifled by the legislation not catching up with the knowledge that's out there. So we're limited on our ability to grow the plant past it reaching a 0.3% level of THC in it. So we have to like test and test and test and shop at the right time because if we don't shop at the right time, then the plant will get what's called hot. And so it'll be like a 0.3, oh no, it's 0.5, you're growing marijuana. And we're like, you're not going to get high on it. So we are playing a very interesting game right now, um, trying to make sure that we can get our plants to uh, a higher level of maturity in the flower formation because we grow for CBD, um, not building materials, which are two very different looking plants. Um, so we just have to spend a lot of time tinkering with that and just really, mm -hmm. again, making sure the soil quality is really good, checking the weather all the time and ensuring, because I mean, cannabis like it's can cannabis sativa l and uh so the genetics are there for cbd but it's still you know that teetering side of the thc level so mm -hmm. um here's our plants after only a couple of uh, i think this is about three to, between three to four weeks after planting little things that are about this big uh, and they grow really well uh they love, they just love it. They love hot sun. They love having good moisture. They like the space between them. Um, we hand weed everything. Cause again, we won't, we refuse to spray any sort of chemicals or do anything. So that's another act of love. And what we do is like weeding sucks <laughs> and weeding on three acres is even worse because you're out there in the hot sun with whatever tool you're using and you're just trying to get these plants out and you're like, okay, I got done. And then a rainstorm comes. And then within three to four days, you've got those same plants coming right back at you. And you just, it's all summer long is definitely um, a labor of love. But again, it really reconnects us with the area. Um, part of our view, I don't have a picture of it, um, but we see Ute Mountain. And I've learned that in the area, you don't plant any vegetables until the last snow is melted off of Ute Mountain. And we had planted vegetables before then, our first year, and then we got a late spring snowstorm the last weekend of May. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I need to listen to the Utes because I know what they're talking about in this area. <laughs> um, so I've definitely not made that mistake again. Uh, and this year is a good water year. So this is in July. We planted the first week of June. By mid-July, this is what the field looked like. Um, so again, the plants just, they love it. Once they get rooted in there and they know you're around them and you're taking care of them, they just start to grow and take off and do the best that they can for us. And we do the best we can for them. And then by September, this was actually the day the Colorado Department of Ag came and tested our field. You can see her car out there. <laughs> um, <laughs> so she just went through and they, they test, um, they take at least an ounce of a sample, but they take it from random plants all over the field. And then they put it all together, dry it out, send it to the lab. And we were compliant. We, you know, we were close to that 0.3. We're at a 0.21 and a 0.24. So had we pushed it any further, uh, we would have been in an issue where the state would have forced us to chop and grind everything into the ground, um, which is really unfortunate because we've heard a lot of stories, especially after the first year when the farm bill passed and everyone jumped on the hemp wagon um, to grow. They didn't know what they were doing and unfortunately lost most, if not all, of their investment. Um, so we are fortunate in the fact that we had savings, we had family, and we did not go into this thinking, oh, we're gonna make a million dollars. We're like, you know, we're on the gold rush or the green gold rush. Uh, we were like, nope, we wanna establish this uh, for longevity's sake. 
and just keep pushing forward with it. Um, so that's my team, my husband in blue and our business partner, Tyler in the middle and all three of us, you know, my brother comes out sometimes he'll help us. I've had some, uh, friends. I think I sent you guys a video, uh, Des and her husband came out and helped us harvest and we had to hand shuck the whole field, which again, harvest is its own beast. Um, because we have to hang dry a portion of the fields and we have to leave a lot of plants in the field to field dry. And so it's a big balancing act on not over drying it, letting it cure, getting it out of the sun. Uh, so yeah, each plant just needs a different, a different style of harvest. And this one is way larger than we, I think, uh, could even possibly imagine when we started. But now that we're getting our skills honed in and we know what we're doing, uh, it's just getting better and better every single year. And again, fortunate enough to have neighbors that are like, yeah, I've got a shop. Will you help me build it? And then you guys can use it. And so we're like, sweet, that's, uh, we'll help you put the roof on and the sides and hang dry, clean it up and, you know, give you back your shop <laughs> and then we'll use it next year. <laughs> so that's just been um, the thing. So the rest of my pictures are of Jess. I don't know if anyone's got any questions or comments or curiosities. Wow, thank you, Cassie. I know, amazing. that's amazing. Incredible work. It's a lot. <laughs> a lot of work. Wow. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions for at this at this juncture? Should we look I have a I have a question, unless anyone else does. Um, Cassie, such impressive work, incredible. And you said you don't use any um, herbicide or pesticide um, and you do manual weeding, which I really appreciate and admire, although I know it's such hard work. <laughs> I can't imagine three acres, gosh. Um, do you use any other um, types of pest management or have you found any other bugs that have really liked the hemp I plants? Um, nothing as far as uh, nothing that eats the plant, you know, so we have a lot of ladybugs that are they love hemp plants. So all summer long, we're walking out there and like most of the plants are just covered in ladybugs, which it's already, you know, natural plant man or pest management in that way with the ladybugs. And oh, the other right. thing that I read is that when plants it's when plants are healthy, they actually don't attract as many pests. It's when plants are unhealthy, upset, they're off gassing certain things into the air that bugs are attracted to. Uh, and so I'm just you know, thankful that the way that we grow and the way that we take care of the soil and the plants themselves from, the, like, from seed to finish um, encourages that in the plants to be strong enough to not need or not even off gas for pests to even want to, to go after them. I read a book, it's called The Third Plate and it talks about like farm to table, food uh, and soil in the first chapters on soil. And it talks about how I think a rutabaga got planted in with cabbage, but cabbage soil content needs something different than a rutabaga does. So the rutabaga is suffering over here and the cabbage is all doing really good, mm. but the rutabaga is swarmed with insects that are just eating it alive, but the cabbage is untouched. And so that, I don't know, mm. I think that plays a huge role in our success in not needing additional plant uh, pest management in the field. Great, thank you. Yeah. So there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Alex Sanchez asks, do you use biological control, natural predators of pests? Who else? Um, oh, okay. So it looks like that's the only question. Everybody else is just so impressed. <laughs> And yeah. you wanna, if you want to come hang out in the fields, <laughs> we'll take some free labor and you'll see how much you'll love it. <laughs> yeah. We always try to get our friends like, oh yeah, you want to come do our, this lifestyle? Like, all right, let's get in the dirt. <laughs> all day. All day. <laughs> all day long. <laughs> so. Beautiful. I have one more question. Um, is the finished product of the hemp look like that slide 2020 top colas or do you break it down even further when you sell it to CBD companies? Like uh, so we, do, we do a two-parter. Uh, so what happens, because this is our, our 
even more successful field than our 2019 field. We had a lot taller trees. These trees are taller than us. Like we're all yeah. about six mm -hmm. foot tall. And so they're taller and wider and we're like, you know, trying to get ourselves through the field all the time. But what we chose to do with our field is we chopped all the top colas and that's what's hanging here um, in the shop is that's just the top, that's the tip top, the best, most like dense flower bud with the highest CBD content. And then the rest of the plant, uh, we just chopped at the base of it by hand. <laughs> yeah. So we don't have any machinery or combine. We just were in there with loppers, just going for it. Um, and so that field dries. And so after it's done field drying, you hand shuck all the flowers and leaves off of the stems. And mm -hmm. so we save the, the smokable hemp is what we hang dry in a shop out of the sun, out of the dirt. So that way it can slowly dry, slowly cure. And then that's what's used in smokable pre-rolls or anything else that people want to do with the cannabis flower. The rest of the material is what's called biomass. That gets put into these giant bags and is taken to an extraction facility where they take all that material, grind it up, and then they put it through an extraction process that goes from uh, whatever level you want. It, right now it's going crude to distillate to isolate to Delta eights, which is um, Delta eight right now is really popular. It's illegal if it's derived from a marijuana plant, but it's legal if it's derived from a hemp plant. <laughs> so again, the knowledge and the legislation are not fully lined up with the people that are writing the rules, but it's also something that is highly beneficial to a lot of people who are not looking for what's found in Colorado, which is very high uh, THC strains of weed. They want something much lower and less potent. And they found that Delta eights as opposed to Delta nines uh, will give you about half as much of the high. And then you have a higher CBD content. So you have a little bit more of a high that calms you down, but you have the therapeutic benefits of the CBD and the pain relief and the anti-inflammatory and things like that paired with it. So it just depends on what level you're going for as a farm sick. <laughs> Uh, we spend months and months growing it, but it's the uh, middlemen and the extractors in the hemp business that are still taking the market where they want it to go for their pocketbooks, and they're not really respecting much of the farmers. So I spend a lot of time on the phone talking with them and just being very straightforward because a lot of them like to talk to you like you don't know what you're doing because, again, there's the stigma of the cannabis industry that you're all just a bunch of stoners and you're like, whoa, we're going to grow cannabis. And then that's what happens. But we're actually farmers and we're wanting to make sure that we handle everything as professionally as possible and that nobody can decide for us what our material is going to become. So mm. it's an even lengthier process post-harvest uh, when we have to sell the material, find an extraction lab. But we just took about 10 to 12,000 pounds of biomass up to Denver uh, two weeks ago. 10 to 12,000 yes. pounds? Wow. Yes. Wow. Wow. Yeah, we cut our field down to 25% of the size it was our first year. And you we use the stalks too, right? Do you yeah, use the stalks? Just the flowers and the leaves. Just the flowers and the leaves, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it would be heavier if we had the stalks. Much heavier, yeah. Yeah, we uh, take the stalks, we leave them in the field, we grind them back in when we're um, working the soil each summer. So that way it starts to build with the organic matter and the breakdown like, wow. in the soil. But and yeah. Joey had a question about who your main buyers are. Who they are vary every year. Um, the hemp industry is quite unstable at this time. So our first season, like we just found whomever we could at the time that was looking, we sold as best we could. We got it to an extraction facility, um, but we didn't get our biomass to an extraction facility until September. And we, you know, almost an entire year later were we able to accomplish selling the biomass. This year we got it to an extraction facility within three months, which is a significant change. But as we grow in this, like uh, we just have to find those people. And on the Colorado Department of Ag website, they have a lot of good resources for you where I found <clears throat> a list of vetted buyers, you know, people that have bonds and, you know, people that are licensed that if they say, hey, I'm going to buy this from you as a farmer, grow it this way. But then they back out at the last minute. There's a uh, a good connection in there with licensing to make sure that people can't do that to a farmer. If the farmer has grown for you, you have to show back up with what you promised. And so they have bonds 
and things uh, vetted for them with their licensing. And included in that is a cash buyer list as well. And so I called everybody. Um, I called over 40 different companies and just put my ear to the ground and try to check out, you know, not only if they're looking for material, which most of them don't look for material until a little bit later on in the springtime, after they've dealt with the first round that they have with their, um, their farmers that they already know, because we're a very new farm. This is, we've only come out of our second year. And so we are also still building our name for ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the ability for the people to know the quality that we have available because there's been issues with people jumping into it not knowing what to do they partially dry the material put it into bags the bags sit for months on end and what happens with moisture inside of a dark bag is mold growth oh, mold. so fortunately that flooded the market the first year there's a lot of bad taste in people's mouths about farmers in certain ways so we have to really stay diligent about our representation of ourselves how we move forward and the quality of what we can prove uh, to them. So it changes every year. This year we're working with a pretty decent company so far. Um, and it's so far going good. It's only been two weeks, but they have to process our, our material along with a bunch of other people's material. And once they have all the test results, we'll sit down and have a conversation about how we want to take it further or, you know, go one way or the other. A lot of them operate on consignment too. So you have to leave your material with them and then wait for payment back once they get paid first. So that's again, another reason why it's harder on farmers to be in this situation because there is yet to have a direct uh, marketplace established mm -hmm. that will be guaranteed for each year that you can uh, sell to. Wow. Yeah. Alex asked another question in the chat, but Alex, do you want to ask it out loud? <laughs> Sure. Thank you so much. This is very interesting and I appreciate your time and sharing your knowledge with us. Um, I'm a big nerd when it comes to this kind of stuff. So I thank you. <laughs> I'm, you were uh, talking about your practices with what you do with stocks and whatnot. And it sounds like you're maybe turning them back into the soil and I'm just, because you're uh, uh, using tech uh, knowledge. Um, is that, um, how do you control for soil erosion or uh, wind picking up the soil and so on? That's a very good question. Uh, so we do plastic mulch, um, which protects our plants pretty significantly. Uh, it's a pretty flat field, but we are up on a ridge. So we have high winds. We've actually had a terrible dust devil that ripped through our greenhouses <laughs> um, and tore the nylon clean off of them. And we had to rebuild, but, um, yeah, we don't, as far as I can tell in the last couple of years, we haven't dealt too much with any soil erosion on our property. We have 35 acres of space that we're working with and we bed it up. We put chicken manure in the soil. We grind our hemp stalks back into the soil and we're just trying to, to build that as best as possible. So each year is learning and I might not know too much yet on whether soil erosion has been an issue on our, on our property so far, because I haven't noticed anything in that direction. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Alex? <laughs> Any other, Alex, did you? All right, yes, thank you. Okay. That was great. <laughs> I was having trouble with the mute button. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Excellent. Any other questions before we move on to Dr. Nelson? I think there was one more, wasn't there? in there that's gabby Anybody? now that was oh um from jesse sanchez is that right have you found tek in your farming practice being more helpful in growing have you implemented the creation of farming as an ecosystem where the farm feeds into itself we're still working on that yeah. Um, with it being our second year and us taking over a former hay field, uh, we're still working on, I'm the one that does the research. So it takes me a while to read a lot of the books and to implement certain styles um, in our practices. We would like for the field to better serve itself. So we do plant cover crops um, that we can also till into the soil. So that way in the winter time we plant the, I can't remember the names right now. I have a list on one of my notebooks somewhere, but um we plant 
cover crops in the winter time. So that way as they grow and then die out and then they till into the soil and it's starting to like build on itself in that way. I'm not sure what TEK is. Is that traditional ecological knowledge Is that? Okay, I still working on that. The application side takes a little bit more time um, because we have to take something that we don't know what's been done with it and start slowly each year adding more to it to build the soil and create it in the direction that we want. We tested for pesticides, herbicides, and heavy metals in our soil. And we are clear of all those because a hemp plant is also very good at soil remediation and pulling toxins back out of it. So that's been um, very beneficial too, that our whole field is being cleaned out each year in that way. Wow. Okay, so thank you so much. Very, very informative and interesting. So um, uh, should we turn things over to Dr. Nelson? Well, thank you. And thank you, Cassie. That was an awesome presentation. So excited to see your work and excited to come visit you and get my hands yes, dirty in your, in your soil sometimes. So yeah. uh, let's do that. Bujin and Dinoe Maganatig, greetings to you all, relatives. Really happy to see you today. So happy to be back with my AIS community. Thank you, Dr. Barker, for welcoming me. And this is so fun to do with you, Cassandra, um, who you know we worked together with Jessica back in 2012, 2011, 2012, and this is in honor of her. Um, I want to just acknowledge Jessica May Orozco and all the love of plants and the love of the world and love of nature and love of humanity that she shared with all of us and her memory is still alive and well within us. So I um, just want to acknowledge her. Um, as uh, Joanne said, I was very, very lucky and privileged to work at uh, SF State um, for 18 years and um, learned so much from my colleagues and students and community there um, and excited to keep those bridges moving forward. And one of the most exciting things I did was required field trip when I would take people to a local farm. So I've been very passionate and interested in food, sovereignty and food my whole life. I'm the daughter of farmers. Um, I'm mom from the Turtle Mountain Chippewa community where she mainly gardened for subsistence to, to just grow food for health and food, <laughs> to put food on the table. Um, and then my dad, same thing, was subsistence farmer from uh, in a Norwegian farming community, mainly wheat and barley and hops and oats, um, kind of the grain belt of the Northern Plains of North Dakota in the Turtle Mountains. Um, before that, um, some of my ancestors were buffalo hunters. Um, and so um, there's a great revitalization of buffalo that's happening um, throughout Turtle Island, which is part of food sovereignty as well. It's, it's much part of a much larger movement, the land back movement, um, cultural revitalization, spiritual reclamation, um, but food sovereignty is a big part of the return of the buffalo as well. And that's why I have a photo of the buffalo there. Um, a lot of my work has been focused on um, community gardening, community indigenous farms, what we call indigenous food ways, all of the associated knowledge of cooking and gathering and seeds and the stories and the songs associated with food and farming, um, right? If, we, if something fun happens, what do we do? We have a feast, we wanna cook for each other, we wanna eat. Something sad ha happens, we lose someone, we give someone food. So food is with us from cradle to grave and it really is something um, significant and you know, who doesn't love to eat, right? Most of us really do. So um, food is such an important part of indigenous cultures. And sadly, with most of the loss of our lands, we've been cut off from our traditional hunting gathering areas, our farmland, many of our um, traditional gardens were destroyed by early settlers. And, um, you know, they, it wasn't even recognized as farming. So there's a resurgence of indigenous farming that doesn't look like Maine, uh, 
uh, Western European style farming. And um, there's an exciting collaboration happening also between organic regenerative farmers, permaculture designers, and indigenous farmers. So a lot of my work through the Cultural Conservancy, the native led organization I've worked with for nearly 30 years, um, we've been slowly growing our native food waste program and um, just recently acquired a second larger farm. We have been co-managing a smaller five acre farm at the Indian Valley Organic Farm and Garden at the College of Marin in Novato. And many of my students have been there. Um, Cassie, did you ever make it there? No, I don't think you did. Jessica did many times. And um, students always said, when can we go back to the, the farm? It was the their favorite part of my classes generally. Uh, and then we just acquired um, an eight acre farm up in the Sebastopol area that the Cultural Conservancy actually owns and operates um, also with permission and support from the Federated Indians of Great Rancheria. We're all intertribal and we always acknowledge that we are on Ohlone, Coast Miwok and Pomo lands and get permission from them to do any work um, in their territories, whether they're federally recognized or not. And we've developed some great partnerships with a lot of the different native organizations such as Segorite Land Trust and California Indian Museum and Cultural Center for the exchange of seeds and food and farming knowledge and gathering knowledge and recipes. Um, so we were very lucky that um, our Cultural Conservancy Foodways program was recently featured in a KCET Tending Nature episode. And um, they did a great little one minute. Uh, I can't bring you to the farm right now. I wish I could. Um, like Cassie, we should all take up her offer to go see her farm. Um, but I can show you, you know, a picture says a thousand words. I'm going to attempt to show a one minute video um, that is kind of the preview to our tending um, the land with the Cultural Conservancy episode. It's like 30 minutes free online. Um, and then I'm going to show you another um, four minute video based on one of our partners, the Intertribal Agricultural Council, that is really at the helm and forefront of providing tools and resources to support Native American farmers. And they do wonderful work. And we collaborated with them through our media work to provide a lot of footage from our farm for that. So let's see if the technology gods will be with us. Let's see here. Let's see, share screen, share, full screen. Whoa, that's big. Okay, can you see that? Okay, no. We need this air, we need this grass, we need the trees, we need everything. It belongs to all of us, not just one person to go out and harvest and take for themselves. Mother Earth is really trying to wake us up right now with climate change to remind us that we are not the masters of life. And we need to look to the indigenous peoples to adopt those practices. We are part of this land. It's a part of us. We have to learn how to understand it and how to work with it. Seeds tell stories of our history and our landscape and our ecosystem. We need to honor the sacredness of life, and it's a resilient vision that is not about tribe, it's about all people, it's about being human beings on this planet and living in a more sustainable, resilient way. Watch the new season premiere of T Cool. So that was actually a different trailer, but it was still a good one. <laughs> that was the trailer for the whole season, which is great with some of our partners um, from Southern California. So that is a good one. Um, and then let's try this one here. Do you see a different video now, a YouTube channel? Great. I never know what you see in, in these things. I'm going to try big screen. Yeah. And then go. Volume is good. There are certain inherent values that we adhere to and uh, respect is, is a key ingredient. That love and care is really, you, you can't help but notice it. We're not just growing veggies, but we're stewarding 
the entire environment, the entire ecosystem that we have here. Everything about gathering is of the earth and of the sea, whether it's harvesting from the waters or harvesting new nafta of the land. You have to be focused on the land and your environment. It's not just communities working in silos, but That's it's Indian form. country working as a whole together in order to, to feed ourselves. Food that we're accessing is part of our traditional diet. Red Lake initial food they had was uh, wild rice. So we added jams, jellies, coffees, peas, sage, representation of our culture, keep our culture going, especially for our young people. Everything that we produce, uh, we grow ourselves. It's also bringing back our role as indigenous people and as original stewards of these lands. For thousands of years, the the Shunak people have been, you know, harvesting seafood and, and it's been a mainstay of their diet. We can take care and take it slow and, and do smaller quantities and higher qualities. The food we grow and eat and the seeds we save, but also how we grow them, how we relate to our food relatives and how um, we really restore the circle of tension. Every inch of tundra is a life force, and we can see it when you're close up to it or from 100 miles away. The thing that we gathered was good for food and for medicine. We always imagined it would be great for your skin. Everything we use from picking to drying to extraction, everything is used in every stage of the process. Families get together to go out and camp and pick berries, and that keeps the family unit together. We started uh, small, processed about 3,000 gallons of oil. Uh, uh, in our first year, and we've steadily grown to the point now where we're going to process about 75,000 gallons of olive oil. I say cold water oysters to like a chef or a oyster bar owner because they really perk up because they understand the flavor is going to be top notch because they know that the oysters are that fine, world-class product. Uh, using natural ingredients and producing a quality product, we stand behind. It really helps the rest of us move forward too in this larger movement of reclaiming and, and revitalizing our traditional food ways. Cool. Anyone else hungry? <laughs> Any comments on those short films? I, uh, I, I love the videos. Thank you so much for sharing them. As so I was watching the videos, I saw how uh, many indigenous plants are, are 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 featured in the videos, like corn and tomatoes and other things that were brought from other parts of the world. Um, as you are in working with different communities, you talk about the importance of preserving indigenous seeds, uh, what people are calling as heritage seeds, like different types of corn. You can grow some corn better in some areas that are more arid and other types of corn that you have to space differently and so on and how that enriches the culture. Yes, absolutely. Was there a question in there or uh, that was a great comment. 
Um, it was an observation, but also I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about it. It's, uh, it's, I'm learning more about it and it's so fascinating. Yes, yes, that's a great question. So for example, um, one of our main crops that we grow is Iroquois white corn. Uh, yeah, and this um, was a gift to us by um, the Seneca people. It's sometimes called Seneca corn. Tuscarora corn, but it's it's Haudenosaunee, um, the people of the Longhouse, the, the beautiful Iroquois white corn, it grows in eight rows. And when the Cultural Conservancy was invited to become partners at the Indian Valley Organic Farm and Garden, um, we were like, okay, we got to grow corn. But being an intertribal or organization, we had Chippewa, we had Yaki, we had Diné, uh, we had Seneca. We're like, which corn are we going to do? You know, we all have our own corn. And the thing about corn is um, it is very promiscuous, um, right? Corn's pollen likes to spread around a lot. So it mixes. That's how we get our beautiful Indian corn, which is all multicolored. And like many of us, mixed bloods, multi colored. And so um, we didn't know which corn to really do. And we pondered it and had talked about it. And then um, our one of our wonderful food waste director at the time, uh, Kaylina Bray said, well, you know, in her humble, beautiful way, my parents have been growing Seneca white corn for multiple generations. And they worked with John Mohawk and many incredible corn farmers. So we said, oh gosh, well, we would love to grow that corn, but do we have permission to? Um, we asked the, the Federated Indians of Great Rancheria. They were like, awesome, you guys grow whatever you want there. We trust you, we love you, we'd love your food. Just share some with us. And then um, the Bray family said, you know, the climate is changing in upstate New York in Cattaraugus in their territory. It's getting drier. It's get, the rains are not as predictable. It's getting hotter because of climate change. We would love to grow out our um, Iroquois white corn in a different habitat. So let's, let's gift you some corn to grow in Northern California. Now, you, we know the Bay Area, right? <laughs> you go over a hill and it's hot, you go over another hill, it's freezing, right? Because of all of our microclimates. Now where we grow up in Novato, North Marin County, it is a hot microclimate. It's like rattlesnake country, literally. It's super hot there. So we said, well, this is a hot, dry environment for the Bay. It's sheltered from the marine layer and the Bay. So um, they said yeah let's let's grow your corn there and they brought it out and um it's done amazingly well it's adapted to a hotter drier environment and this past year actually 2020 we had probably our best crop ever the tallest it was like some of the corn was 20 feet high some of our our you saw the size of these these cobs here are incredible 12 13 inches really thick juicy kernels and so it's really important to grow out our seed in different territories. And that's always been done. Resilience is about diversity and having our seeds grow in different habitats. We don't like monocultures and growing one thing in one place only, um, especially when it's food that can feed the people. And this is really good food. It's not a sweet corn, it's a, it's a flower corn. It's very hard and you need to grind it and um, turn it into beautiful tamales and tortillas or dumplings or bread or porridge. Um, there's so much you can do with it um, when you turn it into that beautiful um, white corn flour. Um, we're also going to grow different types of corn at our second farm because you have to separate corn by space and time. Otherwise, they're going to mix like a lot of plants. And we want to maintain some of the integrity, genetic integrity of these um, heirloom varieties that have been really taken care of for generations. Um, so we're looking at a popcorn. We all love popcorn. Um, it's some good popcorn. Um, we're also... Um, um, 
not Kalina, um, Maya, Maya Harjo, who is featured a lot in the video. She's our current food waste director. Uh, she's an Oklahoma Indian. She's about eight different tribes, but she's been looking at some Muscogee Creek corn and some other corn varieties that she wants to grow out in a different time and place. So that's just something that um, farmers always do um, is try their seeds in different habitats and soils and climates um, to make sure the seed is maintained, even though, um, you know, it's changing in its original habitat. Hope that answered your question there. Yeah, good. Any other comments or questions on those? I'm gonna to go to a little, um, some images. Does that sound good? All right, I'm gonna to go to some images here. Um, I love this image of the beautiful strawberry that is pretty ubiquitous in Native America in Ojibwe or Anishinaabemowin, we call it Odeamin, the heartberry. Um, so that's really a symbol of kind of um, a lot of Native America with our traditional foods and here in California and all over, there's the first fruit ceremony to really honor that first fruit that shows up um, in the forest. And also, of course, the, pine, the um, acorns are so important here um, with the California natives, but to all tribes who um, have access to acorns. Um, for my ancestral food, it's really manomen, the good grain, wild rice. And um, it goes back to our migration stories and is called the food that grows upon the water. Um, Winona LaDuc has been an incredible proponent of our um, Manome and our wild rice relative and really bringing back um, the traditional practices of gathering in our canoes and dancing on the rice and traditional drawing methods like this photo in the upper right um, and then distributing it through her White Earth Plan Recovery Project. It's the best, best wild rice. The wild rice you often buy in a store that's solid black and shiny is usually grown, it's domesticated wild rice and it's grown here in Northern California in the Central Valley by sucking up a lot of water from our rivers. It really shouldn't be grown in California. This is one instance where you do not wanna grow some plants in some territories because it's just so resource intensive. Um, but you can get this good wild rice order it from native harvest. Um, it's really delicious. And so again, it's related to our migration stories. So it has a lot of cosmological significance, not just um, nutritional significance. Um, when we talk about um, food sovereignty in, in California and other areas, we often talk about tending the wild and indigenous resource management that is really based in that traditional ecological knowledge, those native sciences. It's also often called the agroecology. Um, and this really focuses on in situ tending and harvesting of native species and habitats where they come from. Um, and this was done all over North America and especially here in California, a lot through prescribed burns and traditional fire management. In December between rains, the Cultural Conservancy was able to do a traditional burn um, up at our new land. And that was amazing to be able to, to cleanse the land. It replenishes nutrients to the soil, removes pests, um, really um, enhances water. It kind of stimulates the aquifers. Uh, it has so many benefits, so it was great. Um, we do a lot of pruning and coppicing of native plants, as you saw. We've learned so much from our California native teachers. Um, practice the honorable harvest, um, never taking more than you need, always leaving some for the next people. Um, Robin Wall Kimmerer wrote beautifully about this in her book, um, Braiding, um, Braiding Sweetgrass. And again, that honorable harvest is done with a lot of prayer and ceremonies of gratitude. Um, the photo here is one of my favorite California Indian trees, the bay laurel or pepperwood. Um, it's in the laurel family. They're like little avocados. Um, you don't eat the flesh though, you eat the nut um, and you roast them. And it's kind of like pomo chocolate. It's so good. When you roast it and grind it up, it's got this oily, sweet, rich flavor. And it gives you a little, it has a stimulant in it related to caffeine. So it was a good traveling food. And um, 
we gather and I often gift to the Ohlone Cafe or the California Indian Museum because it's their first foods. Um, even as a native person, I'm in their territory and it's their foods, not, not mine. Um, likewise with the acorns, there's so many different species of oak trees in California and all are valuable in different ways. This is the black oak um, that we were cleaning for um, cooking traditionally in baskets with Julia Parker. Um, the great um, knowledge keeper. Uh, another traditional food of the Great Basin area, the pine nuts and gathering with the Paiute and the Shoshone, such an important food um, mm -hmm. and to acknowledge that pine nuts are really, really uh, nutritious and they're expensive if you try to buy them in the store. And yet this was a staple food for a lot of the Great Basin tribes, um, Paiute, Shoshone, um, Southern Cal folks. And um, sadly, a lot of the public lands people um, just destroy these, these pine, um, pine shrubs. They don't value them. So it's become a little bit more endangered and expensive to get. Uh, and then of course, one of my most favorite animal foods, um, the bison. Um, and again, the bison treaty is this awesome new agreement about five years old that is signed between First Nations in Canada, Native American tribes, and um, all throughout the US, mainly up in the Northern Plains, Idaho, Montana, the Dakotas, um, to open up their tribal territories and partner with land trusts and public lands to again, let the Buffalo roam freely across the territory to bring back strength to the land, as well as um, food sovereignty. Um, up in the Pacific Northwest and Salmon Nation, um, there's still a lot of knowledge and wisdom about um, gathering and fishing for the salmon, but sadly they too have been diminished dramatically um, due to water pollution, climate change, all the dams on the rivers, um, commercial fishing, um, salmon has become incredibly endangered, and yet this, you know, is the staple food for so many tribes in the Pacific Northwest area. And this um, smoked salmon was made for us by um, some Hoopa folks, um, Clayton and um, Deb, a few years ago. It was just so delicious. Um, so that's some of the hunting um, and tending the wild of, you know, what nature gives us naturally in our territories. Uh, and then getting back to farming, um, this is part of our Indian Valley Organic Farm and Garden um, at one of our planting day events. A lot of SFSU students are actually in there. Um, and it all starts with good seed. So um, we start with good seed that we've received as gifts from people like the Bray family from the Cataraugus. Um, Seneca Nation, also the traditional Native American Farmers Association, uh, Rowan White's amazing work with the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network of the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance. Um, so it's really important to get heirloom native seeds and, and you know, protect their integrity and grow them out and share them and eat them. Um, and here are a couple of Haudenosaunee folks um, planting white corn, Kalina Bray and Rose Von Totter out at Indian Valley Organic Farm. And we grow a variety of squashes too, and sunflower, of course, and our gourds and squashes, as you can see, love Indian Valley. Um, that's blue Taos Blue Hubbard, um, various pumpkins. We had a Chimawavy um, Hubbard in there, um, some Delicata. Um, and then they're always mixing as well too. You get different colors and shades and varieties of delicious squash. And then the sunflower is immense. It's as big as it looks. It was like, I don't know, maybe 16, 18 inches wide. Um, and we also grew an interesting um, Hopi blue dye sunflower, tiny little seeds, but the holes you could mix and mash up with water and grow and get this beautiful indigo blue that was used for pottery and basketry mm -hmm. and, and dyeing things. So these plants have so much to give us. They give us food, medicine, dyes, you know, clothing, um, you name it. Um, and again, you know, we really honor the stories and traditions um, of the corn maiden, the corn mother um, from many different traditions, the incredible 
evolution of corn from Oaxaca that went north to Turtle Island and south into South America and then turned into all these thousands of varieties. It's mm. just extraordinary. Mm. So corn is, is central to um, the work. Um, and then we work a lot with young folks, um, really growing those intertribal connections with urban youth to reclaim foodways and food justice. This was a, a cooking event we did at the um, intertribal friendship house, oops, oops, a few years ago. Uh, and that was so delicious and so fun. Um, there's also a growing culinary revolution as part of the food sovereignty movement with native chefs um, growing up just there's like three or four generations now of native chefs from folks who started in the 70s, 60s and 70s, then others who became more popular like Walter Whitewater and Lois Ellen Frank in the 80s and 90s. And then today, it's just a proliferation with folks like Sean Sherman and um, uh, Wapapa, Crystal Wapapa in the East Bay and the Ohlone Cafe. So it's very exciting to see mm -hmm. this um, culinary revolution as part of the food sovereignty movement. Um, and here are some of the seed varieties um, that we grow out. We always start in the center here. Those are some acorns and also hazelnuts um, gathered in Marin County. Um, our, bear, our bear seed, also known as the Scarlet Runner, um, that was also gifted from the Bray family. Um, we have some Italian white beans in there. We have tepary beans, a gift from the Tohono O'odham people of Southern Arizona beautiful tepary beans, we, the tan ones, and also the blue speckled ones, a delicious, nutritious bean that grows in very hot, dry environments. Um, and then that was, I think, um, boy, that was, a, I think, a Navajo red bean, and then our white corn kernels, um, some of the black teparies as well, and then a variety of um, corn um, that was gifted to us. Um, we're also involved with the internet, well, the National Slow Food Turtle Island Association um, that is a, a network of farmers, producers, gatherers, harvesters, chefs um, that um, really advocate for food sovereignty at different levels. Um, and it's connected to the larger international alliance um, for food sovereignty through the Indigenous Terra Madre Network and other networks. Works um, where you meet um, Papa farmers from Bolivia, like this wonderful woman here, um, indigenous peoples from India um, with their rice varieties in the middle, um, and so many different seeds and nuts and insects um, to <laughs> eat um, in the international food markets that celebrate um, food sovereignty and food knowledge. Um, to highlight so many of the incredible stories about indigenous foods, um, the Cultural Conservancy, we created a uh, podcast called the Native Seed Pod to serve as an antidote to the monoculture. Um, so you can check out some of the stories here where we interview a lot of seed keepers, farmers, including um, David and Wendy Bray, the gift of the Seneca white corn. Um, and many different folks, traditional hunters, moose hunters, talking about um, bringing back the native food traditions. Mm. Uh, and with that, I will close. So thank you for listening and your interest. And um, so wonderful to share some of these food stories with you. Miigwech. <laughs> um, Michelle had a question in chat about, mm -hmm. and I have no idea how to say this word. Oh. Coppicing, 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 coppicing. Yes, I actually learned how to coppice from the wonderful Kathy Wallace. Um, and it's a technique done by a lot of California Indian folks, but many folks who aren't farmers, right? It's when you need something from a plant like willow or elderberry. We'll use those two plants. And if you see willow or elderberry growing in the wild without human tending, it's kind of kinky, wiry, it has a lot of knots in it, and it's not really usable for basket weaving. 
because it's not pliable because it has too many knots in it. It's, it's gnarly. It's where the word gnarly comes from, not surfers, <laughs> but it's gnarly and kinky and not kinky like San Francisco kinky. Um, so it's, it's not usable for making baskets, but if you coppice, if you cut straight down, it's, it's a harsh pruning method. You cut down to the quick, to the soil. And then like I just did this weekend in my own little home garden here, I did a lot. You, and you know how roses really like to be cut back and they come back and they'll make more flowers for you. Likewise, a lot of native plants um, like willow and elderberry that are so valuable for basket weaving materials and other cultural uses, instruments, etc. If you cut it down to the, the bottom, almost to the earth, it, when it grows back and you do it in the winter so that in the springtime, like right now, all that life force from the underground is going to shoot up in these straight pliable shoots that are not gnarly or kinky. And so those are the sticks um, that weavers generally want to make, for example, with willow, it's the base and many of you hopefully have taken um, uh, Kathy Wallace's uh, weaving class, those are the sticks that you want for weaving. And you can see the difference. She would demonstrate the difference. Fire also, that's why fire is used because after a fire, those shoots come back in that really, a fancy word, morphologically adapted. You know, it, it changes the shape of them. Um, mm -hmm. And with elderberry, for example, that's what a lot of California native folks make um, their clapper sticks out of, uh -huh. the beautiful split clapper stick. And so if you don't coppice and you don't burn, um, elder gets very kinky and wiry and burnt. You can't really use it, but we coppice it, it grows back these long, beautiful sticks and you split it and then you get a really good instrument out of it. Oh. So it's a, it's a quite a, a method of tending um, and, um, you know, maintaining and making the plant give you what you need for your culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did anyone else have any questions for or comments or, or com comments? I, I was wondering, I mean, one of the yeah. things that both you and, and Cassandra talked about were our impacts of climate catastrophe that we are in. And I'm wondering how you think about the relationship between the work that you do in, in food sovereignty and, uh, and the things that are going on in our climate um, and sort of government um, um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And government lack of, you know. Response. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Mm. Like, because both of you, right, it's sort of peppered throughout both of your talks, this sort of having to pay attention to these shifts and their relationships mm. to policies and things. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Mm. What a great question, Joanne. <laughs> you, wanna, you want me to go or you want to? Uh, I mean, for us, it's just paying attention to like, we need to, uh, we watch the weather all the time like we're always like we're not on our phones for being, um, because in Colorado it shifts really quickly um, and we are where the Rockies meet the desert so we're also up at 7,000 feet we're high desert so we have great sun and growing season time frames but storms shift in really quickly out this way um, last summer or last winter we barely got any water like our snow peaks of La Plata Mountains the Ute Mountain the uh, mountains we can see out in Utah, in this area, no snow past March uh, and barely past February too. Like there's a little bit of dusting here and there, but our water table was very, very low last year. And we actually only got a month of irrigation and water access. And then they shut us completely off the rest of summer to the point where in order to maintain the water level in our particular uh, reservoir, they didn't even do a false stock run, which is where they open it back up for like three days and they let all the people with livestock fill their ponds one last time before winter hits. Mm. Uh, 
this year with the polar vortex, I don't know if anybody was following uh, that shift in the weather patterns, but that brought really warm temps and then really frigid temps and a lot of snow. So we've gotten far more snow than we had the last two winters out here. But it just, we, each year we have to, um, we have to watch that because we can't grow as much as we want to grow if we don't have the water. So our first year we managed to water for three whole months in the summertime and then tap a neighbor's pond. Um, this summer we had one month and it wasn't even a significant time. They opened it early May, shut it off three days after we planted our field. And so our pond that was grandfathered in lasted a month because we had only planted three acres, but it wouldn't have worked if we had planted the 12 acres we had done the previous summer. And fortunately we had a thousand feet of high pressure mill hose to run to, through culverts under the road to our neighbor's pond across the street to our neighbors next door. Um, and so it's just very temperamental out this way. And we're planning each year based on what we're seeing in the winter time. Um, one area, one good area out here is I want to do the summer lessons. Gabby had mentioned it in the uh, comments to me um, as far as the planning for that sort of a program. It's going to take a few more years before that can get off the ground because the farm that we have right now, it's in a good and okay spot. But if the weather keeps getting warmer and we get less water in the wintertime, that reservoir we're on is not viable for uh, longevity on farming. So we also need to look to a different area out here, which is tapped into a much larger reservoir of water that would have water the whole time through November, which we don't have currently. So it's just paying attention to the warmth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, boy, it's such a big question. Thank you, Cassandra. Um, yeah, climate change is both, um, you know, a consequence of human ignorance and a cause of human suffering, right? So it's both. It's both of those. And yes, we need to change policy um, at every level. And you know, I'm more hopeful, obviously, with this administration than the last. Yeah. Um, absolutely more hopeful that we are going to get some really important policy in place. Um, but I think as grassroots people, as indigenous peoples, we know we cannot wait for policy and that we need to focus on really exercising our um, sovereignty at the fundamental levels of water, food, and energy. Right. And so that water management that Cassandra just talked about, knowing where the local reservoirs are, mm -hmm. having good working wells, knowing where the springs are. And there's a lot of politics always with water, too. Right. Huge politics. Water is life um, and people own water. So that's a big issue. Um, having enough water access to grow your food, having your seed sovereignty, access to um, heirloom seed varieties that are shared um, warm hand to warm hand, as they mm. say, not through purchasing through Monsanto owned seed companies, right? Um, and so there's like a grassroots network through the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network and the Intertribal Ag Council and the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance and the Cultural Conservancy, where we have seed libraries. We don't call them banks, you know, banks is where you store things. Libraries, you check things out, you, you move them along, you know, like books, like knowledge, it should flow like, like water and um people who hoard and privatize water and seeds it's like we got to get over that right and likewise energy sovereignty with um renewable energies so i think a lot of tribes are working towards that like that second video i showed you with yocha dehe um of course they have money because of their casino but they've invested in organic farms they've invested in water food and energy sovereignty and a lot of tribes are doing that mm. yay deb halland exactly we're all very hopeful that we have, I mean, I know, you know, the Secretary um, of uh, Interior's energy person, too, is a wonderful Navajo woman. And it's just amazing that there's finally some Indigenous women leadership in this cabinet. So let's hope that they're not going to be um, cut off at every step with their decisions and implementing policy that has real positive influence on local communities. So and I don't know if I answer your question, but that's just no, definitely. And 
and just as a as a follow up to that, um, I remember when a, a year ago, <laughs> we can believe that when the first round of of sheltering orders, right, sort of came into place in the Bay Area, you and I had had a conversation about food sovereignty and and COVID or pandemics in general. Yeah. I was just wondering what you've been been thinking about um that yeah i mean is it okay cassandra yeah i've just been thinking a lot about that and i've seen a shift also in indian country um and in you know the communities we've worked with a, a lot of communities i've worked with really have always had food as a strong component mm -hmm. but it was like oh there's other issues economics you know housing health care other issues and I think COVID just really showed how vulnerable we are and how how food is so tied to our immune systems. Food is medicine, right? When we say that, we ain't joking. It ain't a metaphor, right? Food is medicine. What you eat affects your immune system and your immune system affects how you respond to disease. We're always exposed to disease. How do we respond to it? Are we resistant or are we vulnerable? So yeah. I've seen this incredible movement in US and Canada, I know better than other areas of communities that had other priorities that are now saying, we need to become more food sovereign. Like the interest in native seeds and three sisters farming mm -hmm. and traditional mm -hmm. gathering and making your own medicines. The California Indian Museum and Cultural Center in um, Santa Rosa, they had this really innovative project after the fires because they were also very worried about all of their elders who were inhaling all this bad air and couldn't breathe with asthma. And this was even pre-COVID right we've been slammed with a few climate catastrophes that are all interrelated these syndemics these converging um epidemics um that are happening and um they started going back to their elders and documenting their knowledge about traditional plant medicines like an ethnobotany project and making teas and salves um to help their community um and making masks that had medicines in them for inhaling medicines that heals your lungs like mullen. So I think it kind of helped really reinforce the importance of traditional medicine and the concept of food as medicine yeah. because of COVID. Yeah. Cassandra. And the fires. I'm sorry? I said, and the fires. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we've seen that right here in the Bay Area, Scorite, uh yeah. land trust sort of feeding people, right? Absolutely. And and the need to um, build the capacity within our both urban and rural communities to feed ourselves and feed, take care of one another. Um, exactly. Yeah. 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 One last point on that too. Another niche that we took advantage of at the cultural conservancies, we thought, oh no, our production's going to go down because we have less people on the farm. Because the College of Marin kind of shut us out. We could only go in one at a time to farm. So we were really like having a hard time with that. I know. But a lot of big mainstream farms, um, organic farms, in Sonoma and Marin County in San Francisco and Alameda, even small urban farms, they used to grow specifically for restaurants, like, you know, heirloom tomatoes or, um, you know, organic lettuce leaves for the yeah. fancy salads. And because all the restaurants were shut down, all these farms had tons of produce and no outlet for it. So we went around and just gleaned it, yeah. took it for free. They just gave it away. So we worked with Segorite Land Trust and California Museum Cultural Center and donated something like over 5,000 pounds of food um, just in the, in the winter from gleaning from farms that otherwise that good food would have gone to waste. So as Cassandra knows, farms produce so much food, more than enough, and there, a lot goes to waste. So it's important also to be part of community supported agriculture programs and gleaning programs where for free you just go gather up a bunch of great food and redistribute it definitely 
Any final comments or questions from anybody? I have a question. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Jesse. Um, I wanted to ask, how do we go about like appropriately asking for or providing food for um, indigenous communities with heritage seeds. Um, I'm actually a UCP student. Um, I'm part of the Indigenous and Native American uh, Coalition. Um, and we're trying to make an indigenous garden. Um, we're starting from the ground up. So we don't really know anything. <laughs> and so like we want to be able we want to be able to preserve our own foods. And some of us do have heritage seeds, but we want to be able to have like eyes on us and be able to provide for like the local indigenous community. Um, and I was wondering how you go about doing that. Like, what's your advice? We're just babies. <laughs> Aww, that's, a, that's a great goal. Well, um, you know, East Bay, we just mentioned Joanne and I really support and work with the Segorite Land Trust. They are the um, original Chochenyo Ohlone people of Berkeley area. Um, and so they have seeds and they have actually a resilient center um, at their village of Lashawn um, and they grow out foods and exchange foods. So I would definitely start with them and ask for um, you know, their permission to set up the farm and ask for their support and advice um, and to provide some seeds. Um, also, I saw, I think that was maybe you too. Yeah, the fabulous Liz Hoover is now a faculty member there. She's a dear friend and seed sister and she has access through the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network of a lot of great seeds mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and from all over Native America and as intertribal people, urban intertribal people, it's okay we use, you know, Seneca white corn or we use Hopi sunflower or we use, um, you know, uh, Navajo red bean or um, Lakota um, squash. If we use it in a good way, respectfully, um, folks are happy to have their seeds in general grown out and used for native community wellness and, and food security. So I would start with Sugorite Land Trust. Um, Liz has access to many great seeds as well. Cultural Conservancy could help you. Um, Maya Harjo, I can hook you up with, um, who is the um, steward of our seed library, um, could also provide some seeds. That would be my advice. Thank you so much. Mine's just to save what you get. <laughs> if you grow it, save your seeds. Um, that's what I've been doing every year that I've been practicing and growing and drying. And I have like my little hanging dry racks um, to dry different pods of seeds over time and just storing them, store them in a cold, dark place. I've got a whole box dedicated to everything I grew uh last year i've got my corn too it's very small <laughs> but um yeah just keep saving them they give you more yeah yeah i got my yeah yeah we always go back to Mason's. they always want to give you more yeah yeah and also at uc berkeley you're connected to the gill track farms oh that's wonderful who <laughs> is isabella yeah yeah here's um, Pink corn. I can get some pink corn. Yeah. So, um, and seeds like to be put in the ground. You can store them for only so long and they get stale. They need to be um, put in the ground. So Gill Track Farm in um, North Berkeley there um, also has some, they have a great ethnobotanist guy there. Non-native, he's super, Richard, super smart about seeds and plants. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. Okay, well, I just want to thank everyone. Um, especially, Jess. huh? We're going to talk about Jess. I know. And we're at, well, we'll have to schedule a special honoring moment um, uh, to talk specifically about Jessica and the scholarship. scholarship. Yeah. That we're, uh, have kind of a launch party. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do yeah. that. Because I think um, 
I think a lot, uh, I got a lot of emails from folks who couldn't make it at this particular time. So, mm -hmm. um, and who I know would want to, you know, participate, yeah, especially from the, the 2012 cohort, right, of graduates. Yeah. That, Yes. You all went through the program with. So we'll definitely have to come because I just I, I feel like she had such an impact on people, um, her peers and the department and the things that she cared about. So um, we definitely want to keep talking about Jess. <laughs> yes. We can have a whole session to talk about to Yes. Yeah, yeah. Plant biology. <laughs> Um, and the scholarship yeah. and the scholarship yeah and her yeah. and her honor yeah definitely definitely so um again thank you to everyone for your time and attention and um sharing your questions and comments and um do the two of you have any final things you want to share or say before we sign off just grow any plant you can. Yes. <laughs> get your right. and you just get a little pot. If it's just, if it's just like a mint plant from the grocery store, just start small and just, you know, talk to it, keep it by your sink, give it some water, pick off the leaves. I love putting mint in my coffee. So that's like really nice in that way. It's because of Phil's coffee. I miss Phil's coffee and I had to make my own since I live so far away. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. Yes. Just lo love, love plants and know they love you and they feed us and they give us air and they, they can turn sunlight into sugar and they're just magical. So they are. Um, get your hands in the dirt too. Every day is a good thing to do. Yeah. Like just said, plants, not pants. <laughs> plants, not pants. No pants, guys. <laughs> That's not pants. Oh my God. <laughs> It's so true. It's so true. I used to have beautiful plants in my apartment and then I brought home a cat and <laughs> yeah, my cats have destroyed them. They dig in them. I had to like pin them all to the ceiling so they could climb still. <laughs> I know. I know. It's, it's a terrible thing, but um, okay. <gasps> oh. Yes. Yes. yes succulents grow anywhere you can't practically kill succulents and this is succulents in rocks in an abalone shell and you can have it anywhere and you know they're just cute little succulents oh so, yeah all right yeah. well um get good good talk good to connect with everyone um thank you everyone for your time and support We'll post the talk online so that you can listen to it again and again. <laughs> thank you all for listening. And thank you, Dr. Barker and Cassandra and all everyone for being here. Yeah, be great. Thank you all too. Thanks for having me. <laughs>